Hello, my name is David Bruce. Hello, my name is David. Bruce. Hello, my name is David 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 Bruce. Hello, my name is David. Yeah, we'll get back to that in a minute. That's just one of the things I've come across when I started looking into Terry Riley's seminal minimalist work in C. NC has always been a piece I've known as one of the key pieces of 20th century music, a piece that almost single-handedly kick-started minimalism. But it was only fairly recently that I heard a few performances which really expanded my understanding of what it is as a piece, and really showed me how revolutionary a piece it is, or at least potentially revolutionary. I say potentially because I also started wondering whether the piece was just a miraculous one-off, or might it just be the blueprint for a whole new way of composing. And it was really only when I started working with some of the same approaches that Riley uses to try to develop my own project that I learnt a lot more both about how the piece itself is constructed but also about the challenges of putting together something that so successfully builds a complex and flexible piece from such a simple set of instructions. So let's start with something that won't take very long, a look at the score. And this is it, just one page consisting of 53 melodic fragments. There are no instruments specified, it suggests it could be about 35 players, but says that smaller or larger groups will work as well. And each player starts at the beginning and repeats each fragment as many times as they want before moving on to the next. There's a little bit of guidance beyond that to say that you should stay within roughly two or three patterns of each other. The score says it's important not to race too far ahead or to lag too far behind. Although in my experience this seems to translate as stay within two or three patterns of someone else, it's not uncommon in recordings to hear four patterns at once, for example. And that's pretty much it, a single page leading to a piece of music that lasts anywhere between 45 and 90 minutes. You can get a sense of how it works if we look at how these three parts progress here. The key thing, of course, is that they all lock into the same tempo and the same underlying pulse. But while they start together, when they move to the next fragment at different times, you get syncopations and different overlapping patterns emerging. So the piece sounds very different every single time it's performed. Brian Eno said the score is more like a packet of seeds. And every time those seeds are opened, something new and unique grows. The most famous early recording of the piece with Riley himself involved included a pulsed C keeping time with a stream of eighth notes throughout. And this has been fairly standard as part of the performance ever since. But it was actually something of an afterthought, as Steve Reich here explains. I played in the piece uh, with a lot of problems in rehearsal staying together, and I suggested to Terry, why don't we have somebody, you know, the good drummer, why don't we have somebody sort of drumming out something, uh, like C's, uh, that'll just keep us all together, and that's how the pulse entered the piece. But in all honesty, while I contributed that detail, I certainly learned from that piece enormously. So it's interesting that an aspect of the piece that for many of us is one of its most distinctive features was an afterthought. And it remains an optional instruction today, but actually one of my favourite recent recordings, again featuring Terry Riley himself, was by the ensemble Stargaze, and it doesn't have this pulse. And to me what's quite revelatory about it is how flexible the performance is, and how unlike a stereotypical minimalist piece it sounds. It comes to life with this real array of textures and colours which the players manage to conjure from it. And this performance, more than any, managed to open my eyes to how the piece is so much more than just a simplistic blueprint for a minimalist piece. What Riley's actually done, I realised, is he's ceded some control over aspects of the composition and given them back to the players. So the players can now genuinely form a creative part of the finished piece. They're using the full extent of their musicianship to find the right way of joining the texture and creating that overall effect. And I think that's something quite remarkable. What often happens with us composers is that we turn up to the orchestra looking a bit sheepish. And the players see us and they think, who's this weirdo? And that's basically the basis for the whole working relationship. So in this model, there's a much richer sense of co-ownership for the piece, and I'm sure that that relationship is therefore a lot nicer. <laughs>
Another great version of the piece is Damien Alban's Africa Express project, which features musicians and instruments from Mali. This one's a little bit freer, there are some improvised solos beyond the notes written in the score, but it's still again a rather beautiful example of how these simple notes can create a rather beautiful and well-structured hour-long piece with the help of those wonderful musicians who take part. Some people have tried putting this improvisatory aspect of the piece into the hands of a single individual. So here's an interactive website by Tero Parvainen, where you trigger each sample and decide when to move on to the next one. You're still forced to keep them roughly together, so if one pattern gets too far ahead, you have to start moving the ones at the rear up, otherwise you can't get any further. But it's a very effective and nice way to get a hands-on experience of performing the piece without actually having to play an instrument. There's another version which we'll look at more in a minute, where the fragments are loaded into a session view in Ableton Live. Each one is assigned a random number of repeats before it moves on to the next. So here the piece will in fact play itself, or you can move them along yourself manually if you prefer. And several fully automated versions of the piece have also been made, including the wittily titled In C++, C++ being the programming language the code was written in. And again, this uses an element of randomness to allow the piece to progress, which perhaps partly undermines the point of the piece. But one particularly nice computer-assisted one is this one. OK, are you ready? Hello, my name is David Bruce. 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 This is an interactive website called the Repeater Orchestra, and when you make a sound through your computer's microphone, the program repeats it back to you a random number of times. So using this, a single player is able to generate the whole piece simply by choosing when to play the next melodic fragment. So in a sense, as you can see, this allows one person to fulfill that improvisatory role to create or recreate the entire piece through their own musicianship. The idea for NC emerged partly from Riley's friendship with Lamont Young, but also his experiments with tape machines. In a sense, the, the roots of NC uh, started here in Paris. I did work here with Chet Baker in 1963 for a theater recamier uh, project. By recording Tet Chet Baker and making loops out of what he and his, his uh, musicians were, were playing, uh, I started seeing the possibilities of uh, loops and live music. And so it was, it was a prelude to writing in C, so to speak. Riley realised that he could create a piece that overlaps short repeating phrases in much the same way as he might glue repeating tape fragments together. Tape loops are cyclic, you know, it's, it's a cycle essentially is what you're doing, so that you have a landscape that keeps repeating. And uh, by that repetition you start noticing details in the landscape that you wouldn't notice if it just went by once. I did it through technology first, but then I saw that it especially after working with Chet Baker, that it was the kind of music I wanted to do was basically cyclic. Given all these overlapping cyclic fragments, it's quite surprising that there is quite often a sense of meter that emerges. You get a sense of a downbeat, a sense of a kind of time signature, sometimes in two time, sometimes in three time. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that some instruments in some contexts will come through more strongly than others, so your ear latches onto those as if they were the downbeat. So here's a section, for example, that clearly sounds like it's in two, thanks to the repeated bass notes on the viola da gamba. And then by contrast, here's a section that's clearly in three. And this is one sort of journey that happens across the course of the piece. And if you look at the score, you'll see that the piece starts with sections that sound like they're mostly in two. And then there's a central section in three before returning to two at the end. In fact, Riley makes sure that the three section is clearly audible. As you can see, he puts five strongly three based sections in a row. So here the music very clearly moves from two time into three time. And there's a similar sense of journey from the harmony we start out on the white notes with F naturals and G naturals, 
and also quite a few B naturals, so there's a sort of G dominant seventh feel to the opening. And then the arrival of the first F sharp here is quite a significant harmonic event, which feels quite unsettling in a way, especially when it clashes with the Gs and F naturals that are still sounding from earlier fragments. And we then stay with F sharps until we return to the F naturals a little later, and the piece actually ends moving back to the opposite side of the cycle of fifths towards the subdominant F major feel with quite a lot of B flats. So there are two overlapping journeys. One is the metrical journey from twos into threes and back, and the other is the harmonic journey. And there's also perhaps smaller journeys you can map, such as the change of register with this rising movement here, or the journey of the lengths of notes, which definitely affects the overall flow. So when you arrive at these longer note fragments, or fragments with lots of rests, the whole pacing of the music relaxes. And I think it's the combination of these interesting little journeys, all going at slightly different paces, that maintains our interest when we listen. But one final harmonic question for you. Is in C really in C? Well, to the extent that it uses mainly the white notes of the piano and moves between the dominant and the subdominant of C, I guess it is. But it's striking what a sort of gentle and even slightly coy C it is. In the opening, for example, the C only really appears as a grace note. It's really E that forms the most prominent note of the opening. And then look at the ending. There's no sign of a C anywhere. The last one we hear is in fragment 42. I mean, I guess it was inevitable that in such a cyclic kind of piece that arriving at a sort of cadential tonic was never very likely. But it is striking how much of in C seems to avoid the note C itself. But I think the answer here is that the title is more than just about the harmony. The title gives the piece a sense of being really simple, back to basics. And I honestly think it's an important part of its success. People, amateur groups or less experienced musicians are willing to engage with this fairly radical idea because it seems from the title like things aren't going to be too hard. And this accessibility was an important part of the piece for Riley, who very much saw it as music to help create a sense of social bonding. The score itself even generously says, if for some reason a pattern can't be played, the performer should omit it and go on. Now how many pieces of contemporary classical music could you offer that instruction for? So the piece undeniably works extremely well and with great economy and efficiency. As Riley himself says, barely a day seems to go by without a performance of it somewhere in the world. But does it have any lessons for us as composers? Is it just a one-off that wouldn't really work if we tried something similar? Or could we create new, different pieces, pieces that aren't necessarily minimalist sounding, that would in some way mirror some of the approaches discovered in this piece? And I'm really thinking in particular about that communal music making, that way the piece offers a relatively small set of instructions that allows musicians to bring out their own musicianship into the creation of a new piece. So I was trying to think about it and think what other kind of piece could you make uh, where it was built out of a small collection of elements which it was then up to the musicians to build into a larger piece. And I was thinking about some of those great orchestral seascapes you get, maybe Debussy's La Mer, or John Luther Adams's Become Ocean, or even John Adams's The Dharma at Big Sur. I thought perhaps you could build a kind of textural piece that evokes the ocean in an orchestral setting by allowing the players to build different fragments. And of course the piece would surely have to be called In C. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go by creating us some small fragments and loading them here into Ableton Live just so that we can test it out. Um, so I mentioned earlier the version of in C that works on Ableton Live, and I basically just did a very similar process here. So if you look across the top here, you have eight different instruments, and each one, if you look at the MIDI here, each one for each line across is exactly the same. Um, so this opening one is just a trill, for example. So I can start the trill off. This is the equivalent of having players who are just starting this in their own time. And you can see, you can create a nice texture. So what I actually did here was then I decided to just take a bunch of fragments from Debussy's La Mer and see if I could build a little texture out of that. So the second line is just the rising tone. 
And the third line is just a rising tone, a fourth higher. So those all work fine in terms of harmony, they just sit in a sort of pentatonic -y harmony. But I quickly started to realise how important it was to think about harmony when you're working like this. And I could see why the harmony changes so little in in C. You've got just that one change to the F sharp and then back to the F natural, and then one further change to the B flat at the end. And that's over the length of an hour so it's really, um, it's difficult to see how you could build this kind of flexible piece with a faster changing harmony than that. So I tried to gradually increase the, the dissonance. And so when you, when you get down here to this level, you end up with a, an A natural in the, over the B bass. So it starts to have a slightly more dissonant sound. And then I added that C natural there later. These are some other fragments from La Mer. But you can see already how um, we're almost beginning to lose track of the harmony. It's uh, we, we might have any of those pentatonics, we might have the A natural and the C natural all potentially sounding together. So slow moving harmony is definitely one of the key things. This all still sounded a little bitty for my taste, so what I ended up doing was adding this held chord from John Adams's piece to give it a sort of B major underpinning. And then I think everything works quite nicely and a lot better over the top of that. This was my little attempt, but that's as far as I really got, and I think for it to really work we'd have to do away with Riley's structure of a sequence of fragments and find other ways, perhaps splitting things into different groups. So I'm going to go away and see if I can come up with something and I'll report back to you. The key thing I think is to aim for something as simple as possible. I really think the instructions should fit on a page and allow the players to bring something of themselves to the piece. And perhaps this might be something you'd like to try yourself. Do feel free to send through any pieces you create to davidbrucecomposer at gmail.com. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon here. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can do that here. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>